Okay, well, welcome to you all, and uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I would like to introduce the topic of interchange design by taking a very broad look at the subject. Um, I was originally asked to speak about interchange design in London, and given that there's, there's more than 600 significant interchanges in London, I felt this was a task I couldn't match. Uh, and I thought, as many of you are from the boroughs, uh, I'm probably treading on your territory anyway. So I'm going to take a much, a much broader look. And interchange is really uh, important, particularly in city transport. Could I just ask, in your journey here to this venue, which, how many of you uh, performed an interchange between one public transport mode and another? Hands up. Almost half, I would say. Um, in London, for travel to the centre, uh, on average, each trip involves one interchange. So the people who don't make an interchange is counterbalanced by those who make more. So we're not talking about a marginal activity, we're actually talking about something which is central to the whole functioning of the, of the transport network, especially in a major city. Okay, now, I should have checked how I change this. <laughs> Thank you. So what do interchanges do? The essential feature of, an in, of interchange is that it reduces the need to have individual routes serving everybody, every origin and every destination. Instead, we group them together and allow people to change from one route to another. So this means that we can perform with a network as opposed to many, many different routes. So it's quite different to uh, the car pattern of travel. Also in a big city, it's important for interchange to link trunk or f fast public transport services with shorter distance ones. So you, you make part of your journey by a fast mode and part of your journey by a slower one. So this, in this way we can bring more destinations within an easy reach or within a certain time available to us. And also in the outer parts of London in particular, um, the interchange can be providing an interface with what I call the car world. And what I mean by that is that people who are sat in a car think about where can I drive to and where can I park. People in the public transport realm think quite the other way around. They think where can I get to with the routes that are available to me. And these two worlds are largely independent and they only come together at park and ride uh, stations. Now this image is all right. Um, in a smaller city, uh, this is Milton Keynes, and this is a, uh, a proposal in relation to the growth corridors that are occurring in Milton Keynes, a proposal in terms of the shaping of a new public transport network, uh, and the idea was to bring two diagonal routes together in the central boulevard of Milton Keynes. So a way of rationalising what are potentially complex movements into a simple cross pattern. There's plenty of precedents for this model. Um, I'll just give you one example. This is um, a small town, Lemgo, in, in North Rhine-Westphalia, in Germany, um, where there was, there was a shamble of routes, bus routes, and they were rationalised into, a, again, a star pattern. In fact, the, the, the Stadbus um, logo here actually represents the idea that, again, these diagonal routes all come together at the centre. They all arrive at the interchange point five minutes before the hour, and they all leave five minutes after the hour. So from any part of the town, you can get to any other part of the town by interchange at the centre. And on that rationalizer, there's actually every uh, 20 minutes this happens, not just on the hour. And after that happened, um, the, no the average passenger ridership increased from one per person per year to 63 per person per year. So a dramatic effect in increasing ridership numbers and I think that just making the point that when we talk about interchange design, one of our objectives is to fit in with the overall policy objective of encouraging public transport use rather than travel by car. Never mind the detail. A similar idea, but on a, on, a, on a different model, can be found in San Francisco. 
uh, which like many other American cities was built on a strict grid. It's a disjointed grid as you can see, it runs in two directions, but by and large the bus services are organized, they're either running east-west or north-south. When you buy a ticket they give you a free transfer ticket, in other words you get two tickets for the price of one. And that means that you can, in that system, uh, take your east-west bus and then change onto a north-south to get to your destination. So you can actually reach any part of the city from any other part of the city for one purchase price and with only two uh, vehicles. So why is design important? Well, the first of all, I've, I've talked about what is the function of an interchange and the key aspect of design I would argue is to actually ensure that those functions can be properly performed. So a good design is an interchange that works well. It's as simple as that. But there may be other things which can be added in terms of objectives. <coughs> For example, we could bring joy to the journey, as I've phrased it. Um, in other words, does it have to be something which we, a necessary evil that we have to do, or can, it, can there be some delight in the process of making the interchange. After all, interchange we would all prefer not to, I guess. We would all prefer that our mode of travel picks us up at our front door and drops us at our destination without any need for changing. So it's an inherently negative thing. So there is perhaps some argument that if you can make an interchange more enjoyable, then uh, it reduces that negative perception and hence encourages more people to do it. Um, but then, of course, the, the third aspect is that the, the interchange itself uh, is a feature in its, in, in its locality and this can have an impact on the, on the appearance and the character of that locality. In some of the examples we'll see in a minute, um, that impact can be very dramatic. So it's important to get it right. Now, I think uh, from a public transport operator's point of view, uh, interchange is perhaps uh, it's important to remember the passenger focus. But, the, but even so, we have to remember that it is a system that we're dealing with. And I've said that interchanges are like an open access industrial plant. And if you open the doors to an industrial plant, you'd expect it to be provided with a high visibility vest and a, and a hard hat and, and, and regulation boots. Um, it's not quite as bad that with interchange, but sometimes the bus stations uh, in London as, as elsewhere can sometimes feel like straying onto that sort of dangerous territory. There's a lot of heavy equipment moving around, sometimes at high speed, and potentially they're very dangerous and confu confusing places. So interchange design, it's important that uh, the actual process of making the system work does not intrude too much on the passenger experience. So there's vehicle movements, there's the need to provide space for vi uh, buses to lay over for timekeeping purposes. Space has to be provided for that. Routes have to be found in between the bus stops and the layover space. Then of course there's all the backup of the operational system, be it uh, emergency equipment, fire control systems, uh, uh, regulation of service systems, facilities for the staff and accommodation and so on. So there's a whole load of stuff going on which the past passenger has no interest in at all, but nevertheless is essential to make it work. So that's the system design. And just a few examples. Um, uh, this is, I thought, rather funny because it rather looks as if it's the pedestrians that are the dangerous thing. Uh, pedestrians are, are dangerous. Um, no, of course it's not the pedestrians that are dangerous. It's pedestrians need to be warned about the dangers uh, of straying into the bus station. But what a welcome for a bus station. I think that's pretty good. It's not London, I have to say. <coughs> um, I'm borrowing from Paris here. This is um, uh, Saint-Denis in north, northern Paris. Uh, bus, tram, interchange. And I thought it made the point that there's an awful lot of kit, a lot of transport kit, and the sort of question is, how easy is it to walk through the bus station, through the taxi rank, through the tram stops? What kind of an experience is that, and does it work? Perhaps we'll find the answer in a minute. <coughs> mm. 
the plan of Appledorn isn't there, but the photograph of it is. Um, Appledorn in the Netherlands is just one example of what they call dynamic bus stations, whereby instead of having a bus assigned to a stop, you have, you have stops, and then you, you wait in a particular area, and when your bus is signalled, it tells you which platform to go to. And it's quite useful in uh, both um, at quiet times and in quiet places where there aren't so many people so that everybody's waiting in the same area and this can be much more secure uh, late at night, for example. So even in the London context, um, you know, this kind of system could work as, a, as an out-of-hours or late-hours uh, system. And the walking routes to the stops can be rationalised. Here's another example. This is Zurich. Zurich is usually put forward as the, ex the example of the most um, uh, exalted public transport system. But uh, it does have its nastier bits, and the Hardbrooker station is one of them. There is so much transport kit, the pedestrian is completely forgotten. And our own Victoria, well, anybody who's ever been to Victoria and tried to make an interchange will see that it's uh, sadly neglected. Uh, part of our system. So instead of uh, system design, we have to deal primarily with passenger focused design and to make the system work around that. We need to protect people from uh, the dangers of vehicles. We need to provide them with clear information and not just within the interchange, but the information, especially these days, can be provided in all sorts of ways. It can be provided in your office, on your mobile phone, on the internet. Uh, and why not have re real-time information? I get a little buzz on my mobile if there's a service disruption on my uh, tube, for example. That kind of thing can, can only grow with the, with the technology uh, that we've now got available. Clear walking routes is a really important aspect. Uh, and, of course, in the London situation, the volume of passengers is often such that even though there is a clear route you can't see, unless you're very tall, <laughs> because there are so many people ahead of you. So the information and signing above eye level is really important. Um, mobility routes, well, that is the challenge for London. Uh, whilst the requirements of Disability Discrimination Act uh, are being applied generally, on the, it almost doesn't apply to London's uh, underground system because of the fact that it was built at a time when such things weren't thought about. So that's a real challenge, and what we do with that. Um, my lo local station, I noticed today, is going to be provided with a lift. Um, but, of course, you have to choose your destination station very carefully to make sure that's got a lift as well. So it's a, it's a real issue, that. Um, then there are the core facilities to make the interchange work, and information and tickets are obviously um, fundamental, otherwise the thing doesn't work. But there's many other facilities which can be added in to make it more uh, passenger friendly. And adding joy to the journey again, why not add a few attractions or distractions uh, to make the journey more pleasant? This was an early example of getting the buses out of the passenger realm, uh, a Stockholm bus station. And now this model is, is fairly generally used, and Hammersmith is a good example in London where you wait in a protected and fume-free, noise-free area until it's time to board, and then you go through the door into the bus. Um, that, works, that works very well. At this example, in a suburb of Copenhagen, um, you are, in effect, uh, confronted with a large amount of road space with a lot of buses in it. But on the other hand, um, it's rationalised there are two clear lines of sight from the station exit points, so you can see exactly where it is you have to walk. And the buses are all traveling in, in one direction, and so uh, it's reasonably good sight lines and it's reasonably safe. You're discouraged from walking in the other places because there are these little walls. I don't know if you can see them there. Um, but the logic is such that you don't really want to walk in other directions. It's, it works very well. So this is the station forecourt, if you like. Sometimes interchanges really 
not helpful because of the way things are positioned. So in Dortmund, for example, the main railway station is some distance and at a different level from the tram system. And uh, the station is where this photograph is taken from, and the trams are up here. Um, but in between was a dual three-lane carriageway highway of which the pedestrian access was through subways. The subways have now been taken away. The road has been reduced to two, uh, dual two lanes instead of dual three. Cycle lanes have been added, and the pedestrian crossing is very broad. I think it's uh, f uh, 35 metres broad. The broadest is actually in Strasbourg that I've ever seen. I think it's 55 metres broad, which means that people can wait in a line so that when the lights go green for them, they can all cross together. Whereas unlike in Hammersmith, where you queue up behind one another, so it actually takes longer to get across the road, even though it's a narrower road, because of the fact that you're all in a bunch. So there we are. That's, a, that's an example. Um, this is rather an old photograph, um, but Munster perhaps was a bit unusual for its time in providing all the information about the bus services in, inside the station, despite the fact that the buses were run by a different company from uh, the, the National Railways. Now, how many times you come out of a station and find information about the bus services within the station building? Um, it happens in London, but not that often. Uh, and in other places, it virtually doesn't happen at all in Britain. But why not? It's part of the transport system. It's what you need to know. When you come out of the, the station, you need to know exactly uh, where your bus is. These days, of course, it would have real time as to when the next one's due and so on. But this is 20 years ago, this picture. Uh, there was also an interactive hotel booking, and I actually used that. Within five minutes, I'd arrived at the station. I had my hotel, and I knew which bus to get to get there. Very easy, especially as I don't speak German, uh, but it worked perfectly. Information should always be clear as to where to find it, and I thought this was rather nice. <laughs> this was the building which was called the bus station. Uh, So, um, I've talked about adding delight or joy to the journey. Um, we can, of course, indulge ourselves as designers in producing interchanges which are in themselves delightful things. Despite the fact that the interchange is just for passing through, they don't have to be dull uh, or horrible places. We can think about iconic structures or you know, designs which are going to impress I have a few examples. This is the Lisbon Expo station. Um, it doesn't come out very well. <laughs> but uh, it's not boring, is it? You may not like it, but it's not boring. And the little town, Swiss town of Chur, um, the bus rail station has been rebuilt with this new bus shed for the regional buses. And uh, again, it, it, it isn't, it's the sort of structure that you wouldn't normally associate with the humble bus. So you think, well, the buses must be significant if they're in a place like this. And in Madrid, uh, the station, which is now playing host to the high-speed train running to the south to Seville, um, they had to build a new station to accommodate those trains. And the old train shed has now been converted into a rainforest. So it's very hot. Well, Madrid is very hot. Um, it's very hot, but uh, there's a perm spray coming onto these palms and so on in, in the train shed. Again, you can't see it very well. Basically, the entire train shed is taken up with this forest. It's wonderful. <clears throat> but of course, as we know, any of us who are designers know that the essence of design is compromise. There's always things you'd like to do this, but then you can't because of that, and, and so on. And with interchange, it's no exception. For a start, we have a conflict between uh, speed and convenience. There are the people who are in a hurry. They just want to go. They're not interested in any of the things I've been talking about. They just want to get there, and that's their objective. And if these people... Um, uh, watching a display or admiring the architecture or something, they're getting in the way and that's actually a conflict. And so there's, 
the capacity of the interchange to handle the, the necessary passenger flows must be one of the prime considerations and the other things, if you like, can be built in if the opportunity is there. <clears throat> Perhaps the biggest conflict in design, and it's also a kind of, um, it's almost a cultural or moral issue, is to what extent the interchange should play host to revenue earning activities. How much space should be given to retail uh, and to commercial activities? How much space in terms of you know, what the eye encompasses should be given over to advertising as opposed to the important information as to where your train or your bus is? And I think there are some places that have gone uh, completely over the top in terms of converting interchanges into revenue earners and I suppose Gatwick Airport's got to be the, um, <laughs> the prime example. Um, you know, where is my gate? I can't see in between Harrods and, you know, it's a, it's a shopping centre and somewhere at the back there's something like an airport. So that's a, that's a conflict. More widely, the interchange sits in a particular location. And because interchanges are more accessible than humble stations, they are potentially places where one would want to increase the density of housing, offices, uh, commercial activity, or whatever, because this is a place which is well served by public transport as a destination, and therefore you want to bring uh, activities to that location. But at the same time, if that location is trying to be the interface between the car and the public transport system, and you're trying to provide car parking, there is a direct conflict. Um, and if, it's, if you're attempting to do it all at ground level, uh, there is no way. So very often you come out of a station and the town you're looking at is sort of somewhere over there be beyond the car park. So the interchange, in effect, despite being accessible in itself, is not playing host to the volume of activity that it could do because it's, those activities are somewhere beyond the car park. Oh dear, these, these pictures aren't coming out very clearly. This is Leipzig Station BC, ah, BC before capitalism. Um, an absolutely magnificent uh, hall in Leipzig Station. The full grandeur is, is not reflected there, but um, I, I thought I'd, you know, I was very really impressed when I saw this. Um, I was less impressed to see it as it is today. Oh, I can't. We can't see it. Basically, it's a shopping mall now, that space. Uh, it's indistinguishable from other multi-level shopping malls. A better example, and quite a historic one, is Glasgow Central Station, where the retail is quite discreet. It doesn't interrupt the main flows of people through the concourse, but the things are there, the Marks and Spencers, the chocolate shop, and so on, the things you need. Um, but it's in this rather, rather nice timber uh, structure which I presume is Victorian or Edwardian. Okay, that's a pity. I wonder why this isn't reading these things. Sloterdijk in Amsterdam, I'll have to talk about it, is a, is a main railway crossroads. Huge, huge station on different levels. And it was in an area to the west of Amsterdam that wasn't formally developed and is now building up as a major commercial centre. Um, so it's almost like a, a rival to central Amsterdam in terms of uh, its role, but it all hinges on the fact that it's built around this interchange. I'm out of time. By contrast, Ebbsfleet Station... I haven't been here for 25 minutes. Just 25 minutes. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, Ebbsfleet, it's basically a car park and a station. There's a lot of opportunities being missed there for development around there. Joy to the journey, so formation juggling in Lille. Um, mm, this is, no, I, I, won't, I won't talk about that. The interchange concept demands system integration and I think this is something where, where we're particularly on the cusp at the moment in London because we now have a situation where the, there's the prospect of having the national rail services integrated into the Oyster system 
and this will completely transform interchange and travel patterns, uh, particularly in the south half of London. And so interchange designers have got to get geared up for this. In a sense, a lot of the interchange opportunities that have been there in theory have not been there in practice because people won't do it because they have to buy two tickets. If that changes and the railway companies are um, all taking Oyster on board, then we have a completely different set of choices as travellers and we will have, we'll see some big changes in passenger flows at the different interchanges. So that's, that needs to be taken into account. Iconography and identity, I don't need to talk about very much. London is one of the best in the world. I did want to include, if I can borrow a minute or two, um, I wanted to include the Zurich network because in my experience it is the most integrated in the world. I may be proven wrong at some point but nobody has yet challenged that statement. Um, a quite phenomenal system where the approach has been to create a network. It's not individual routes and if you look at this network map it's very hard to distinguish even which are trams and which are buses. The, colored, the, the blue ones are buses, all the other colors are trams. But basically it's all presented at a single network and there are so many interchanges and they all work. They've either got a very frequent service, six, six minutes, which means you can interchange without, without a watch, or if it's late in the day or if it's the outer suburbs, and the services are less frequent, then they're timed in the way I described with Lemgo, so that the, the buses arrive to collect passengers off the train. And added to that, the, the payment and the fare systems are totally integrated. Your same ticket will get you on your tram, your bus, it'll hire your car, it'll hire your bike, it'll take you on the national rail service, it'll do your shopping for you. So it's a fantastic, it's, it's fantastic. And the interesting thing, the really interesting thing about Zurich is that it has done this without these grand gestures and grand projects. They went instead, they spent the money to make sure that every interchange worked. So here's an example, it's a bus tram interchange. It's a very simple, very functional design, not expensive. And the tram, as you can see, is not a whiz-bang, super dupe tram. It's very functional. And they've gone for function over design in that sense, but spread it throughout the entire system. <clears throat> well, we've talked about facility centres. Um, this is Kyoto Station. This isn't really an interchange, this is really a city. 16 floors, mixed-use building with a station, and a bus station is in the forecourt, as you can see. It's very hard to depict this structure with a, with a single photograph because it is so vast. Once you're in there, you can spend your life there. There's parks, there's restaurants, there's cafes, there's offices, there's everything you can think of within this structure. Is it possible to click that? It may not work. No, okay. That was a movie, but there we are. Finally, um, we have to design to meet changes. I've mentioned one or two already. Ealing, for example, is likely to become a more important town centre. It's also due to get a, a tram. Um, Tottenham Hale has changed its character because of the interchange with Stansted Express and Victoria Line. Shepherd's Bush has got a sucking great new shopping centre being built next to it. So instead of being a backwater interchange, it becomes a key one. Stratford has already become key and will be more so with the Olympics. And Paddington and Liverpool Street, very noble termini, uh, will, if Crossrail gets built, become stations on the way to somewhere, to a much greater extent than they are today. So we have to think about what change is going to occur before we set about devising the, the design. Canning Town uh, development is an example where if, if that level of redevelopment took place, Canning Town uh, interchange would become a very different place. We also have to design to meet trends and innovation, as increasing cycling, uh, especially in the suburbs, the provision of car clubs and short-term car rental, and provision for mobility impaired. 
the cycle and ride. And finally, um, this is what we can do about pro promoting cycles. This is in Freiburg. It's, this is a cycle storage structure, but it also has a cafe and information. You can buy tr public transport tickets. It's right by the main station. Uh, it holds 1,000 bikes. Rent and repair. And it's available 24-7. Uh, and I just wanted to make that point that when you're designing an interchange with facilities, it's important to think about what is the hours of operation because there's no point in having facilities which don't match the, uh, the hours of operation. Otherwise, uh, you're confronted with something like that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Thank you.